Good to see you. You too, bud. We'll see you soon. Good evening, everyone. Where I am in the world, it's Andrew Kerr speaking, and I'm the um, uh, licensed immigration advisor f- um, and owner and director of Network Migration Services. Um, excuse the state I am. I'm just wearing a T-shirt at the moment. I haven't been well for the last 10 days. I caught a virus um, at a migration expo about 10 days ago. And in fact, most of the team that were at the expo caught this virus. So somebody was traveling around there with some bug. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> if I, <coughs> as you can see, if I happen to cough a little bit through it, <coughs> sorry, please excuse me. Um, Thank you, uh, as always, for Ruan uh, setting up tonight. Ruan's our marketing manager and he sets these up. We do them pretty much every fortnight now, every two to three weeks. But we have separated them. Tonight, we're just doing Australia. It's going to be quite quick. It's 20, 25 minutes of thought it'll take tonight because Australia is quite quick to talk about. Um, thank you, Desiree. Desiree Linda Q is our operations manager. She's actually based in our Auckland office and also is uh, a provisionally licensed immigration advisor. Um, I'm mentoring Des over the next few few months, of course, to get her fully licensed, um, although I often believe it's the other way around. Um, and thank you very much, Desiree, for joining tonight. Thank you, Liz. Liz is um, also becoming licensed uh, at the moment. She is uh, working in our Johannesburg office and is a senior consultant in our Johannesburg office and also our HR manager. So when it comes to, of course, CV writing and, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, processes and procedures to help obtain um, that all-important job. She's an integral part of that. Of that. And welcome to Peter Lemma. Peter's joining us tonight. I wasn't expecting Peter tonight, but um, when it comes to Australia, of course, um, or New Zealand for that matter, jobs are essential. The difference with New Zealand is you need a job up front. And that's why Peter, Peter is South African. He's based in our New Zealand office. He's also our MD over there, and he's been in New Zealand now for seven years. Um, and Peter, I'm going to invite Peter on screen just to talk about the job search process and how it actually works, etc. The difference with Australia and New Zealand is 90% of you that are listening to me tonight will be doing an application for Australia and all of the application processes will be completed whilst you're offshore. And then, of course, your visa is granted um, and the uh, uh, we then hand you over to, of course, the job search training team, when it, uh, which is Peter and his team. Um, when it comes to that all-important process of finding work. One of the advantages you do have with Australia, of course, is when you've got your visa up front, it does tend to be a lot easier, of course, to um, to find work associated with your qualifications and or experience. Um, um, there, were a, uh, there was a question or so earlier, uh, which we'll get into, and I think it was from Randia, uh, regarding the sponsorships and the 482 visas, Randia, I'm going to invite Desiree on the screen shortly um, to talk about that. Um, she's our absolute guru, not only, of course, on New Zealand, but also on Australia. Um, and when it comes to our 482 um, applications, et cetera, we, we run them via Desiree always because um, she's fully au fait with the processes and procedures, not only to get in on a 482 visa, um, and the pros and cons, but also, of course, potentially turning that subclass 482 visa into residency whilst you're onshore. So as I said, tonight's going to be very quick. Um, you can see on the first slide here, I am MARA registered. That's the Migration Agents Registration Association of Australia. Um, and of course, I'm IA registered for New Zealand as well. But be a little bit careful. Please use a MARA agent if you're going to use an agent. Um because and and the irony is New Zealand you have to be registered whether you're onshore or offshore but Australia you don't and they've been talking about for many many years now gosh I've been in this industry for 30 years and for the last 10 15 years in fact uh, licensing became mandatory for New Zealand um, in 2007 I think it was from memory and Australia talked about following suit making it mandatory for people to become licensed if they're going to give immigration advice while they're offshore, and they, they haven't done that, which I must admit is quite surprising. It's, it's a really in, interesting to do. Um, the process is, is, you know, for registration is, is extensive. It takes up to three years to become a registered agent, costs quite a bit, little, little mon, bit of money, and you have to maintain your registration every 12 months. So just be a little careful if you're using an offshore agent. Make sure they're licensed. Um, again, it's not law, so that if, if you're dealing with a non-licensed advisor, they're not actually breaking the law if they're on sh- offshore. But if they're onshore or have offices in, New Z- in Australia, they have to be licensed. 
So what I'm going to be doing um, um, is uh, th just a very quick thank you to our service providers that are in both countries. Uh, we've actually, in the last week, we've, we've re-cemented our, our thanks to Ruana, myself, and, and, and Rose, et cetera, and the team. Um, we have re-cemented our uh, relationships with our service providers. So we are quite literally the one-stop shop. Uh, when I say one stop, um, we have a visa division, of course, that does all the visa work for yourselves and your family, et cetera, and are relevant of the visa type. I mean, let me just go, uh, you know, go, get to the next slide. So network migration itself has been around for over 30 years, and I've, I've owned the South African um, network migration services for those 30 years, um, and we're going to just do Australia tonight, as I mentioned. But when it comes to um, – that's me a couple of years ago – when it comes to Aussie – there is not a, uh, a visa that we cannot assist you with. Tonight, we're going to be talking mainly about skilled migrant, but please, um, uh, Jade, just send us your CV, and we'll talk about that, and I'm sure Liz or, or Peter or Des will answer Jade. Um, I, all I need, Jade, is your CV, um, and we can assess you. But I'm going to be talking mainly about skilled migrant, but clearly there's not a visa we don't do. We do student visas, we do family visas, business visas, investor visas, work visas, which of course are generally a subclass 482 up front, um, spousal visas, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. So there is not a visa that we cannot assist you with, okay? Uh, you must forgive me, my children are ordering takeaway. Hi, please let them in. Hold on, thank you, hold on. Um, sorry, yes, uh, I'm working, so my kids are, um, are wanting takeaway tonight. Um, anyway, so there's not a visa that we actually don't do. Um, so if you're if you're wanting to find out about investing or business or jobs or whatever, please just email us. All our emails are our first names: Andrew at networkmigration.com, Peter at networkmigration.com, Desiree at networkmigration.com. So it's pretty easy to remember at networkmigration.com. So thanks, Ruin, for putting it up earlier. I did as well. If you want to be assessed, I mean, there's about 130-odd people booked in for tonight. If you want to be assessed for Australia, just send us your CV. Simple as that. Or send us, if you want information on a business visa, just ask. If you want information on a student visa, of course, just ask. But just before I invite, I'm going to invite um, Peter in first to talk about all the job search training and whatever that, that he does, which is mainly towards the end of the process as your visa's been granted for Australia. But of course, if you are looking to potentially apply for work or f try and find a sponsor in Australia, um, and we don't, by the way, we don't help you finding a sponsor. And by sponsor, I mean somebody that is going to work with you and pay for this whole process. It's not part of our services. I'm not saying we can't help you if you do have a sponsor, because clearly we do. But it's an extremely time consuming and very, very difficult to do is find an, a company that's willing to sponsor an application. Some companies do, uh, but clearly, and we, you know, we, we, we know one or two of those organisations, but most companies won't. They'll wait until you've actually got your visa. Uh, and then the beauty with Australia is when you've got your visa, you've always got a period of time, generally up to around a year, to take that visa up. And that's when we hand you over to Peter. Um, and I'm going to bring him in now. Um, and I'm also going to bring in Des now. Uh, to the wing, I think. And then where are you, Miss Linda Q? Um, sorry, question and answer poll, Peter. Um, uh, so mostly ge generally do, uh, towards the end of the process, oh. when we would <coughs> you to Peter. Hi, Peter. Um, Hi, Andrew. And Peter, of course, would be the person that's helping you with the job search processes and job search training. So, Peter, unlike New Zealand, where, of course, you know, I would normally show a bit of a video on it, et cetera, et cetera, the Australian process, as clearly we're all well aware, is different. Um, what what sort of services do, does you, you you and the NZ team, of course, being in that part of the world and in the down under scenario, um, what sort of services are you able to assist the clients with as and when their visas are granted? Hi, Andrew. Yeah, Um Australia, the nice part about it is that you have the right to work before you go to Australia, um, not the catch-22 like you're sitting with in New Zealand. So, But also, you don't want to land in Australia and then have to start only your job search and networking and sort of applying for jobs and things. So 
what we do as a as the job search training expert what we do is we take you through a whole process to network with people in australia before you land in australia now when you land in australia you want to sort of hit the ground running meet setting up meetings with people recruiters uh, potential employers so what we do is all, we do that whole groundwork because also understand you're burning south african rands in australian dollars so it hurts the pockets a bit. So the better prepared you are when you land, the the more money you're going to save and you're going to have meetings set up. So what we do, we go through what we call the four pillars of networking. And we do this uh, face-to-face training, sort of online face-to-face training with you. We go through the four pillars. The first pillar is pillar one, where we t- set up your LinkedIn profile for you we set it up with all the settings correct that it it presents yourself as strongly as possible then the pillar two is we teach you how to network at five different levels in australia and normally people only network at about one or two levels we teach you about all the other hidden levels that people don't know about then pillar three is we teach you how to start marketing and branding yourself already while still in your home country before migrating to australia and then uh, pillar four is the all important part is where we go through the interview and culture training. So the cultures are totally different to, let's say, South Africa. And we teach you about the interview techniques, how to get your value add across to the employer. And we set up with about 30, 40 questions we give you to prepare. We can have mock interviews with you just to get you to understand how, how to answer the questions correctly. and. Um, I think the more you prepare, you should be starting about two, three, three to let's say four months before you're planning to move to Australia to start getting networked, getting people aware that you're coming. And we also teach you then how to work on SEEK and how to apply on SEEK for jobs as well, which you now have the the appropriate visa. Um, Peter, that's actually a very good point. Sorry to interrupt you. Is the beauty with Aussie would be... um, and I'm sorry, I've, I've enlarged it for somebody and I'm not sure how to dis- not enlarge it anymore. Uh, stage is empty. Oh, that's clever. Uh, there we are. Um, I'm, um, when, when, uh, Des, hi, Des. Hi. <laughs> um, Des, when Australia asks for the medicals, that is normally around about three to four months prior to them granting the application? Well, it depends. So we like to have the medical submitted as soon as possible so that it doesn't delay the application process. So once we get your application in, um, DHA's online platform will prompt you to go and do your medicals and they will give you a referral letter that you will book through your ME account and you'll print that letter off to go do your medicals. Um, Once you have the medicals in the system, it can then actually be allocated to an immigration officer. So with the subclass 189 and 190 currently taking nine to 10 months to process, um, I like to tell clients after about six months of their application sitting in the pool to start working on their LinkedIn so that they're making those vital connections um, before they're wanting to travel to initiate that visa of theirs. Um, which is going to be granted in approximately six months. So, so in association with what Peter was just saying, then, then Des, what would you be suggesting? So, I, mean, I would say once you submit your um, permanent residence, your one eight nine one ninety application, uh, because those applications take nine to ten months. After about the six month mark, I would start working on your LinkedIn. Um, as Peter can attest to, it does take a while to start building on your connections and making those connections with Australian companies. Um, you know, you might want to get in touch with recruiters and let them know that you're in the visa process and um, ask them, you know, when you do initiate your visa, can you maybe stop by and have a coffee with them? Um, so it's just it's making your name known before you actually hit the market. Uh, With the subclass 491, it's a little bit different. That processing time is about 22 months. So you don't want to be telling recruiters uh, six months into the process, you're only going to be there in 18 months because they're probably not going to remember you. So um, Uh, with the subclass 491, I would be doing that a little bit later. 
Okay, so back to what you were then saying, Peter, we're all suggesting then that as and when they're selected, then they would engage your services. That's correct, yes. Yeah, okay, all right. And, and I mean, again, Peter, sorry, mate, I know I interrupted you, but I think it was quite pertinent to talk about that at that stage. Anything else you wanted to point out before you move on and have a busy day in New Zealand? <laughs> No, I think just, yeah, the better prepared you are and the more groundwork you, you've done before going to Australia, the less time you're going to be spending there sort of, you know, burning up South African rands and Australia dollars and you can hit the ground running and, and get a job much quicker than if you only started getting everything going when you land in Australia. Okay, perfect. Well, Peter, thank you so much. I'm sure you've got a busy day ahead with consults and et cetera. Um, I'll, I'll remove you if that's okay, and then Des and I will just finish it. We've only got about another 10 minutes to go, so uh, then Des and I will just finish it, if, that, if that's fine with you. Thanks, Andrew. Bye, everybody. Thank you, mate. Ciao. Bye. Bye. So, um, Des, I've already pre-introduced you. Um, thank you, somebody, for asking me to enlarge that. I've never done that before, so I did. I hope you took your screenshots. What I've done here on this slide, of course, and the next slide is just given you the current way that you can actually be assessed. Now, I'm not going to go through this in detail tonight. Um, you've got it now. It's screenshotted. A lot of it's obvious, of course, age, um, you know, is age, etc. Just do note that your age, of course, scores. If you're over 45, you can't do a general application into Australia or a skilled migrant. You can do a business application up to and including the age of, uh, well, up to 55, but you can't do a general application. You're going to have to set the English test highly likely if you're going to Australia, both you and your spouse. Your points for qualifications are there. Your points for employment are there. Um, and the employment, of course, must be related to the qualification you're claiming. And then you get bonus points. And you've seen them for, uh, Des mentioned, a 189, 190, 491. They are the three main visas when you're doing skilled migrant applications. Um, and they're all based on states nominating you, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there's the other. So hopefully you took screenshots or video shots or whatever off your phone of those, or if you're on your laptops, of course, you've just taken a screenshot of that. Um, Des, coming back to to what Randir, I think, was asking about the 482, do you want to just give a bit of a summary on, on, on the 482, which is commonly a work visa for Australia? Yeah, sure. So the 482 is um, the work visa option, um, which is based on employer having a job offer for you. Um, the newest changes, I think maybe Randir was alluding to, was the requirement to up that minimum salary to 70000 per annum. Um, so that minimum income threshold has gone up. The really nice thing with the 482 is we have a lot of clients who have um, job offers or get job offers um, and they're busy with the, the skilled migrant, the general skilled migration process. And that's going to take nine to 10 months. And they'll do the 482 because that visa takes approximately two to three months to grant. Um, so what it entails is that the, the employer needs to become a standard business sponsor. They need to nominate your, your occupation. So they'll need to uh, do an application to DHA, which shows that they have actually um, advertised for the role and that they were looking in the local market um, and they, they found that you were the ideal candidate. And then once they put in that nomination application, you can then do your visa application and uh, you, you and your family can be included on that application. And it should take approximately two months to come through. And you can then travel to Australia. It doesn't mean that you need to put your general skilled migration application on hold. That can still be processing in the background. So basically, you would land in Australia on a temporary visa and your permanent residency visa could still be in the process and then come through while, while you're onshore. And he did mention quite rightly that on a 482, because of the temporary nature of the visa, you're not covered for schooling and you're not covered for healthcare, correct? That's correct. So there is a bit of confusion because the 491, which is the temporary um, visa of the three visas that we mentioned under general skilled migration. So just a quick recap on that, your 189 and your 190 or your permanent residence applications, meaning that you have access to Medicare, your children will have access to uh, schooling, government schooling, and um, you will um, be able to enter Australia as a permanent resident holder. 
um, with the 491, it is a temporary visa, but it does give you those benefits um, because it has a built-in pathway to residency, meaning that you have to remain in Australia for three years and then you'll have a pathway to residency on the 491. So the difference between your 491 and your 482 is that the 482, um, again, is, is employer-sponsored and it doesn't have those benefits. So there is some confusion around that. And if I clear up anything today, I hope I clear up that um, the 482 does not have benefits, no Medicare, no schooling, whereas the 491 on the general skilled migration, it, it does have access to those benefits. Cool. And there's, I mean, is there an age restriction on the 482? No, so you can do a 482 at any age. There is no age requirement, but something that you would like to keep in mind is that um, there are only very specific exceptions if you're wanting to do a permanent residence application from your 482. Um, if you're wanting to just work and, you know, get an income and send that back to South Africa and your intention is, is always of coming back to your home country, whether that is South Africa or anywhere else, um, there's no age requirement. But you might say to us, you know, I'm going on this temporary visa, but how can I stay there permanently because I don't want to come back? And then it's nice to have a chat um, with the migration agent. I mean, all of our eligibility assessments are free and we can then give you your options and give you the steps that you need to work towards in order to get residency once you're unsure. Thanks, Des. George, um, I've, I've had the screen up for a while. Just, just, just if you're watching on your laptop, George, just go full screen um, because my IT abilities aren't that great. So um, I did go full screen a minute ago and I don't know how I did it. Um, so... <laughs> Just go full screen or George, seriously, just email us, mate. And I mean, everything that we're telling you now, plus the assessments, plus information, et cetera, is free. We don't charge for this, guys. This is something that if you want to do, we can find everything out from us and then go and do it yourself or use somebody else if you want to. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But um, the important thing of, is we'll, you know, also just something there's, if I'm sitting on 65 points, does that mean I automatically will get selected? No. So with your 189, 190 and 491 visas, whether it's the government that's selecting you on the 189 or a state or a region that's selecting you on a 190 or 491, each of those um, authorities will have their own minimum benchmark. So the 189s, although the benchmark is 65, I don't think I've ever seen a 189 selected on 65 points. So that 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 minimum fluctuates between 70 to 75 to 80, depending on the pool selection at that time. Um, and the very and the same with states. I mean, um, I always let my clients know before you start the process, do a mini point breakdown for yourself so that you know what you're aiming for. But then when you're done with the skills assessment, uh, because each occupation has its own skills assessing authority so when you're you've completed your skills assessment and you've completed your english language test you're going to have a very realistic idea of what points you can actually claim because in most cases your skills assessing authorities will let you know how many points you can claim for employment and how many points you can claim for your qualifications at that point do another point breakdown for yourself so that you know what sort of points you're going to be claiming and then set a target for yourself and say, well, I'm only sitting on 65 points. The likelihood of me being able to do a 189 is very slim. So let me put in a 189 EOI, but let me also look at a 190. And they will have a 190 is a state nominated um, um, visa. So you'll need to look at which states are nominating your specific occupation. And as you go through each state, you're going to do a lot of reading because each state has its own minimum requirements when you do that state nomination application. But you're going to go through each state and you're going to see what their minimum requirements are. Most of the time, the states are very happy with 65 points, um, including their five points for you nominating them on a 190 and on a 491, the 15 points that they give you. But it does mean that you will be put into a pool and they will likely select you in most cases. Um, but states do update those processes, um, you know, weekly, monthly. So it's very good to do that double check for yourself. Check with the state that you're interested in. Go and check 
uh, what their requirements are now before you start the process and check again just before you do an EOI. New South Wales made major changes yesterday to how they look at EOIs and selections. So it's always good to make sure that you're most up to date before you're doing an EOI. Which is exactly why you should be getting the information from agents. And I'm just going to use something that Liz actually um, mentioned to me today. Hope, George, I hope that helps. I have gone to full screen for you. God only knows how I'm going to exit full screen, but anyway. Um, but Liz mentioned today she had a face-to-face -face consult with myself and herself. Uh, I wasn't in, of course, because I wasn't well. Uh, but Liz is going through licensing, of course. Um, and at the moment, as long as I'm there, she's allowed to give immigration advice. But the interesting comments that we actually had from the client um, was um, that, and they were using another agent. And I'm not going to mention other agents' names. It's you know simple as that. But um, they they were using another agent. And the can you still see me, Des? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, what was very interesting was how the fact that the the, the comment was. Gosh, I've been using this other agent now for three or four months, and I've spent an hour with you, and you've told me more in an hour than my agent has told me for the last three to four months. Mind blowing, quite frankly. Um, but you know, it is what it is, and it's very much a case of um, um, making sure that you get the information up front and all of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, get it up front, get it um, in a in a manner, of course, that you can completely understand it, and then you can make a decision on who, if you're going to use an agent, on which agent you're going to do. And one thing about the weekend, being at the expo last weekend, again, I mean, I, I probably met 15 or 20 people that are using other agents. And guys, I'm not necessarily bad mouthing anyone here. I'm just saying. It's, it was astounding to us as a team how few people knew exactly what they were doing, and yet they're using an agent. An agent is there to be fully transparent on what this process is. That's the code of conduct. That's what we must do. And, and in fact, Des, I mean, you'll know this better than I. Surely in the code somewhere, it, it talks about that. It talks about full transparency for clients, et cetera, et cetera, or am I wrong? No, that's correct. Um, our role is to help you as the client make informed decisions and you cannot make informed decisions if you don't have the information. So um, I I'm not sure about other agents, but from the way that we work, um, as I've obviously just alluded to, I let my clients know at certain intervals that we will have meetings because I think it's very important not only to have it in an email, but for me to explain it to my, my clients that are going through the process. Um, and then we'll have one-on-ones and we'll discuss, okay, this is what I needed from your skills assessment. Your skills assessments is now being processed. What now? Um, I mean, most skills assessing authorities are going to take eight plus weeks. I mean, at the moment, VetAssess is taking approximately 20 weeks. So it's very much dependent on your occupation, how long the skills assessing authority is going to take. And we can then start putting plans in action. Um, you know, if you would still need an English language test or if that was something that was required by your skills assessing authority, like uh, with teachers, um, you know, do we put in an EOI 4189? Do we put in an EOI 4190? Do you want to rather wait with the permanent residence applications in the system for a while before we try or attempt a 491? So these are all very real conversations that you should be having with your agent to make sure that you understand all the implications and then you as the client need to make an informed decision with your migration agent. Thanks, Des. Um, yeah, I must admit, we all, and listen, we've been doing this for so long, we all get frustrated about it. I often wonder, and again, everybody has their own business model, but you might be an electrician, you might be a plumber, you might be a teacher, you might be a job, working in a job that requires registration. Do you know that 90% of agents out there don't help you with that? We do. Um, you know, if you're an electrician um, and, and I'm using an agent, for example, and they're sending me a link on how to get my registration done as an electrician with VetAssess, et cetera, et cetera, um, 
my argument would be, well, what am I using you for? You know, and again, everybody has their business model, but I'm astounded at how many people, how many companies in our industry just don't assist with the nitty gritty, I'd call it. You know, um, for example, our job search training is a free service to you. Whereas and other agents, and a lot of them do send you, oh, listen, there's, there's Seek and, and Trade Men and Deed and whatever. There's the links. Go find yourself a job. You know, our job search training is six hours long um, and intense. You know, you might be, as I said earlier, a teacher. And, you know, how do I register with AITSL? What does AITSL even stand for? It stands for the Australian Institute of Teaching and Successful Learning. You should know this stuff. And when you are sitting in front of an agent or you're, um, you know, ask them, open. Do you assist with, the, with, you know, the full process, with the process that allows me to become registered, for example, if you're doing a job that requires registration? And we do. It's as simple as that. And we've, we've factly, we've always done it. Um, and a lot of other agents, and Des was having a conversation with other agents um, uh, the other day, and again, lovely people, don't get me wrong, but sort of saying, well, you know, they were sort of saying, well, why do you do that? Um, you know, we don't do that. Why do you do that? Am I wrong in that conversation, Des? No, you're you're right. And um, mm. the very short answer to that is that we care. Um, mm. I had a conversation with a client the other day and she said, you know, you, you're definitely in the right line of work because I can see that you're very passionate about it. And and what I love about the people that I work for and work with um, is that we're a family here and we all care about our clients. So your successes are our successes. And obviously, yeah. we do that. And, and, and any issues and, you know, I mean, you know, we're not perfect. I mean, we've had we've had visitors reasons rejected. I mean, the amount of rejections we've had out of 16,000 odd families is less than 1%, but we still get the odd rejection. And it breaks our heart too. But one of the advantages that we've got as being a license for Australia and New Zealand is if there was an issue with Australia, we can switch you to New Zealand because New Zealand is a completely different kettle of fish. And I'm not going to go into New Zealand at all tonight. Uh, Tatenda, how easy is it to convert a visa from a visitor's visa to a work visa? You've got to be extremely careful here, Tatenda, because if you're going into Australia on a visitor's visa, Desiree's just mentioned a work visa is going to take, on average, Des, four or five months. Yeah, so it's going. Your part of the visa application is going to take about three months. Um, but just remember, as I mentioned, it's a three-step process. So your employer first needs to become a standard business sponsor, and they need to have a nomination application. And so it might take a bit longer than what you're hoping for, or that your visitor visa is granted for. Well, and as Peter mentioned earlier, to tender, if your visa is granted for that long, spending five months. Um, in Australia, waiting for a work visa to come through is extremely costly, uh, especially if, if you're coming from an African-based country, because, of course, our, our, our uh, currencies at this side of the world don't tend to be that strong. And, uh, and Boris, estimated cost for the whole process, still you travel to Australia? Estimated cost for the whole process, still you... Sorry, Boris, the question actually doesn't make a lot of sense, but um, only because of just the way you've worded it. My apologies. But the costs are based on what you want. You might say, I just want I just want my registration done, please. Or I want the full package for myself and two children and families, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, so you're, I mean, you're looking at anywhere from probably $2,000 to $15,000, $16,000, depending on what you want. And I'm talking about Australian dollars, not US dollars. So in rands, for example, you could be looking at anything from 20,000 rand to 200,000 rand. All right, depending on the types of services that you actually require. What's Jade asked here? How does it one go about finding sponsorship job in either New Zealand or Australia? Is there a website that offers sponsorship jobs? I've never seen one of you. Oh, no. Well, so, so Jade, it's going to be very dependent on the job offer that you're able to well, get. Especially an as a graphic designer. I've been doing this 30 years, Jade. I've never seen a graphic designer sponsored in financially yeah. ever. So Sorry. when that word sponsor, um, if you're looking at the financial obligations of it, um, if an employer does offer a relocation um, cost in, as, as part of your package, um, it'll only be to a certain threshold. I mean, I've seen some clients with that were very lucky and they got up to $3,000 as a relocation cost um, and flights. I mean, that's huge, but it's not something I 
50 all the time and I've been doing this for nearly nine years. So it, it, it is a few and far between. And I do think it's it's based on the company specifically. So if they're willing to offer that, um, although I must admit the few times I have seen it, it has mostly been trade occupations and it's just yeah. because- Or engineers um, maybe. Yeah, it's just because mm. that market is extremely competitive. And Jade, regarding your comment, I do actually remember your surname now because it's a lovely surname. I think it's I think it's French. Anyway, I could be wrong. Um, but regarding your comments on fees, we are one of the few agencies that will allow you to break your fees down, especially for New Zealand. Not necessarily Australia, but remember, Australia is going to take two years, so you can pay us off over two years if you want to. But if it's New Zealand, we're happy to accept some fees in 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 your home country, be it South Africa, and we're also happy to set. Um, uh, receive quite a bulk of our fees while you're working in New Zealand. So just contact me, Jade, and just ask me for what those things are, and we can perhaps have a chat about it. Uh, family of two children, both, and both, the cost I'm talking is for a family of two children, plus both parents, both postgraduate qualifications. Boris, just drop me the email. I mean, if you, um, with your CV, are oh, you welcome, Jade? Um, Boris, please just send me the CVs of both of you tomorrow, and then I will have a quote to you by a close of business tomorrow. Simple as that. You'll have it all. And then if you want to have a free consultation, please feel free. Guys, I'm going to um, – uh, we could we could talk about this all night. We're probably going to have a session probably early next year, which is a question and answer session, et cetera. Thank you, Ron. But I just wanted to mention – oh, and Des, thank you so much. You have a fantastic day. Um, we're going to let you go now. And um, love to the family and looking forward to seeing you in plus minus six weeks' time. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Me too. So, ciao, Des. We'll um, remove from stage. Yes, I'm going to remove you from stage. Okay. Ciao, Des. Bye. Bye. And then, okay, guys. And then just lastly, relocation services are free. So, you might want to find out what it costs to take a pet or or meet at an airport or, or open a bank account or shift some funds or um, take some furniture, whatever. We're the, we are literally the one-stop shop. We can put you in touch with our service providers that will uh, uh, quote you and supply those types of services to you. So thank you so much, everybody, for um, contacting or being online tonight. I hope you have a great evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are. And as I said, all our information we're going to give you moving forward um, is absolutely free. And clearly, if you engage our services, we'll quote you accordingly. So thanks, everybody, for, for logging on tonight. Have a great evening if you're in Africa and a great day everywhere else. Ciao, guys.